Hey folks, John Thompson, Spring Framework Guru. So the video you're about to see is a module from one of my Spring Online courses covering Spring Core. Uh, I hope you enjoy it and a lot of good content in here. And if you like what you see, please head over to my website, springframework.guru, and you can learn more about my courses there. Hey guys, John Thompson, Spring Framework Guru here. Today we're going to look at setting up one-to-one -one relationships using JPA. This is probably one of the more common associations that you're going to create when you're setting up JPA. So what I've done is we had our existing customer object, and I'm going to introduce a, a user object, which would be a, like a user credentials for logging into the system. So customer is one, one type of entity, and then related entity is going to be user. I'm going to go in and, and show you how to set that up. Okay, the first thing we want to do is I've gone through and coded quite a bit here. Just I didn't want to spend time coding and, and have you guys watching that. I want to actually show you that, walk you through the examples. What I've done is I've created a new entity class. Okay, so it, it's smart annotated with entity at the top, user, it implements our domain object interface. You can see I've got the ID value, the version, and now I'm introducing a, a new concept. It's called transient here on line 20. What a, a transient property means is kind of exactly what it, it sounds like. It's only temporary in state, so this property isn't stored to the database. Obviously, it, it would be a bad practice to store an unencrypted password to the database, even though it's been done plenty in IT. It's definitely considered a no-no, especially if you're going to be at a large company that's dealing with PCI compliance or SAS 70 or SOX regulations, any major company is going to have a regulatory environment that's going to prevent sensitive data like a password being stored unencrypted in the database. And this is really just a, implementing a best practice. So what I have is a, a password field that's transient, and then I have an encrypted password. And I'll show you how we, we do the encryption here. So nothing too, too uncommon about this. I've gone in and I've refactored our project a little bit so now I moved the map services into their own package and I've done a map implementation of the, the user service. And then I've also done moved over the other, other ones as well. But we're going to be looking at the JPA service. And what I've done here, here's the JPA service. It looks pretty darn similar except for the encryption stuff. And I added in an encryption service. So I've grabbed a hold of a Java encryption library. It does just uh, simple passwords. And so I set up a, a strong encryptor bean and I wrap that up in a security service. So this encryption service will do two things. It'll encrypt a string that you give it and return back the encrypted value in the string. And then it's going to also check the password. So you can pass in a plain text password and the encrypted password and get back the verification on that. That's something that we'll probably implement in the future. We haven't implemented that yet. Then here's my implementation. Pretty simple implementation for the encryption service. It just grabs a hold of the service, does the encryption and, and returns it. And I've gone in, let's take a look at the JPA DAO implementation. It looks very similar to what the CRUD operations that we had for the others, except now I have uh, a check. So if that password is set and the transient property password is set, we're going to encrypt it into the encrypted password property. And then we just save it like a, a normal entity. I've written an integration test for this. And in the test, we create a new user object, give it a, a username and a password, and then we save it. And we're going to assert that I get an ID property. And notice that I'm not setting the ID that gets set by Hibernate when it gets persisted. And also I'm going to verify that the encrypted password gets set. So we, just a, a simple test. I'm going to run that now. So we can see that it passed. I put some output there so we can actually see that the password did get encrypted and, and that's been persisted. And I'm going to, I'm going to start the Spring Web application just to show you the H2 database that's been created. So that's up and running. I'm going to refresh my database console in Chrome. Connect. So now we have a user table here. I'm going to run this. 
and we can see that I have an encrypted password column, but no password column. So I want you to prove to you that the password truly is transient and it's not going to get persisted into the database. We added this. Now we want to make that user a property of customer. Let's go over and take a look at the customer object. We had to make a, a small change to him. And we set up a one-to-one -one annotation on user. And I'll show you down here at the bottom. We also have getters and setters, standard getters, setters, nothing, nothing special about it. Now, there are additional JPA mappings that we want to work with where you can control the join column and the join type. But right now, we're going to go ahead with the defaults. And I want to use the cascade feature. So what the cascade is going to do is allow the cascading of operations. I'm going to show you why that's important because I'm probably going to want to save a user with a customer. So I've modified the customer service DAO implementation and now we've got a little bit of duplicate code here from the user service but we're going to have to encrypt that string for the password again. But now I have a customer object that can get passed into the service with a user and that will save both. And that's the, the merge property. If I didn't have that cascade, this would fail to save. I think that Hibernate throws a detached entity. And let's take a look at my JPA DAO test. And now I have it saved with user. Actually, I'm going to change this and add a password. So now I'm setting up properties on the user and we're going to run this test now. You can see that my test did pass and what's happening now is I'm saving the customer and I'm also asserting in my assert statement that the user property did get a, an ID value. So we never set an ID on the user so that was done by Hibernate and under the covers what Hibernate is doing it's going to go out, save the user, get the ID value from that, and then save customer and associate that ID value with the customer. And I'm going to show you in H2 how the database structure changed. So we are, we're running against the integration test runs through on its own instance of H2, and I'm, I have the, the web console up as well. So now our customer has changed, and you can see that it has a user ID column and this is where it's going to store the ID property of the associated user. So here the user has ID and it, it's a, a naming convention to use table name underscore ID for the referencing column. So this becomes user ID and this is how Hibernate is going to, going to map things out and this is all created by Hibernate. It, it's doing that from the JPA definitions. And what's important is you can override the ID value if you ever need to. You frequently will need to do that for legacy stuff, but right now I'm just using the defaults. So we don't have to specify any name differences. So JPA by default is going to behave a certain way and we're taking advantage of that so we don't have to do additional configuration. Okay, this concludes the module on one-to-one -one mappings in JPA. You saw we created a, a new user entity and this is a standalone entity, so we followed our design pattern of providing a map service and a, a JPA service, and that those services only handle the, the persistence and CRUD operations for user. And then we went over and added user as a property of customer, and because we set up a customer to have a cascading operation for persistence, cascade of all, so when we create a new customer object with a user object in it, both objects are going to get persisted by Hibernate to the, the database. So it's important to understand the cascading actions there and remember that there's actually multiple database actions happening in a merge operation. So if it's a brand new entity or two, two brand new entities, Hibernate's going to go out and save the user first into the database. And that's what's going to generate the ID value, the ID property, then it's going to go and save the, the customer and take that ID value and append it into the ID value in the database. So remember I showed you the user underscore ID property. We need to get that from the save the user record in the database. 
so we can add that information to the customer record.